Okay, so I'm filming with my iPhone and I'm noticing that the screen is not showing up very well, but my face is, or as soon as I put my face in. So anyway, I hope you're able to follow with the slides um, as best as possible. And um, this is the slide on action potential, the neural impulse that travels along the axon and then causes the release of neurotransmitters in the synapse. So we're talking about an electrical impulse in terms of connecting these neurons, these billions of neurons, super quickly to one another, right? And so how does this all happen? Neural impulse is all about ions or charged particles. The neuron is covered with a semi-permeable membrane. If you can imagine this is the neuron's membrane. And the balance of ions across the membrane creates a membrane resting state for the neuron, which is typically around minus 70 millivolts. Um, the inside of the neuron is filled with potassium, um, which is positive, um, ions and anions, which has a negative charge, which are big molecules that stay put. They're too big for the channels, um, for the ions to pass through. So essentially, there's gonna be some ions that pass through, chart that change the charge from the outside to the inside. So as a remember, on the inside of the neuron, it has a um, resting state uh, that creates this resting state in the uh, membrane at negative 70 millivolts. Okay, so there's this balance right here between the potassium ions and anions, as well as on the outside, which are sodium and chloride. And um, the chloride is negative and the sodium is positive. And then there's a sodium potassium pump, and that keeps the resting state balanced by pumping in and out sodium and potassium to keep that resting state at minus 70 millivolts. What happens is when you have an action potential, there's a depolarization. And the next slide's going to talk about that, where there's an electrical charge that's sent down the axon. Enough stimulation in the presynaptic neuron. Remember all these different um, dendrites are stimulated in the um, presynaptic neuron, and it causes sodium ions to flow into the neuron, and it causes a depolarization. So all these positive sodium ions come inside the neuron, and it creates a very positive state right here. And what happens is the membrane uh, potential goes from minus 70 to plus 30, and it's a process called depolarization. It eventually reaches its peak. Um, sodium ions flow out and potassium items ions also, also flow out, leading to repolarization where the um, millivolt level goes back down and goes below 70 millivolts in a process called hyperpolarization. And then eventually the cell uh, membrane rebalances at minus 70 millivolts. So think of the process of this action potential of sending this wave of um, electricity down the axon to communicate to the next um, neuron to release the uh, neurotransmitters that then commun communicate to the next uh, neuron. Think of it as an electrical wave. And what's happening is there are a bunch of positive ions that are jumping in here. And what they're doing is positives repel against each other, so they're pushing these away and pushing them down the axon. As well as with each time they're going down, more sodium ions, positive ions, are coming in as well. And as you can see right here, this kind of like battery looking thing, it kind of propagates like a wave, if you will. Occurs one segment of axon at a time. Sodium goes in at one section that triggers the potassium to start going out at section one, and the sodium to cart com start coming in at section two, and so on. And they start falling like a row of dominoes down to the terminal buttons where it causes the release of neurotransmitters into the synapse. So this sodium potassium pump just basically allows these um, sodium and potassium to get pumped in and out to keep the resting state. And there's also these channels that once the neuron is told fire, it basically opens these sodium channels and potassium channels to start flowing in and causing that process of depolarization, which is that electric, electrical 
um, impulse that gets sent down from the uh, soma right here, the body, down into the axon. And it's allowed to jump really fast by this myelin sheath and these things called nodes of Rainier that allow, allow it to kind of jump spots and stuff. Jump spots, basically. It doesn't talk about that in the book, but basically it, goes, it allows you to be able to think really instantaneously and fast. Uh, neurons do not touch one another. Instead, they communicate chemically at the synapse. And uh, neurotransmitters are chemical substances that carry signals from one neuron to, to the other. Receptors are specialized sites that specifically respond to certain types of neurotransmitters, sort of like a lock and key phenomenon. Next slide kind of shows this. I believe you probably can see these uh, visuals, which is nice. Um, so remember the action potential, the energy gets sent down the axon and it hits these terminal buttons and it causes the terminal buttons to release these neurotransmitters. So the neurotransmitters are released into the synaptic cleft Cleft. The neurotransmitter is attached to receptor, exciting or inhibiting the postsynaptic neuron. Um, the separation of neurons, so basically then it'll sum it up, right? And if there's more excitatory and less inhibitory, it means it's going to send another action potential down and keep communicating down the line from one neuron to the other, right? So receive, right? Sum up, send energy, action potential down knock the uh, terminal buttons and release neurotransmitters, start the process again, right? Dendrites waiting for those neurotransmitters like a lock and key. What happens to those neurotransmitters that get left in the synapse? They get re-uptake by um, the neurotransmitter um, or they get recycled uh, by an enzyme called enzyme de degradation. An SSRI is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. And what it does is it helps with depression and it helps keeping serotonin in the synapse. And what it does is it inhibits the reuptake of serotonin, thus leaving serotonin in the synapse. Popular uh, SSRIs are Prozac, for example, and Zoloft, I believe. Uh, and excitatory and inhibitory signals. Postsynaptic neurons can produce signals of two types. Excitatory, increase the likelihood a neuron will fire an action potential. Acetylcholine, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and glutamate are examples of those. Inhibitory, decrease the likelihood a neuron will fire an action potential. Serotonin and GABA, both excitatory and inhibitory are dopamine. And you can see those in the example of drugs and it kind of brings it to life when you think about drugs that are either excitatory or inhibitory. And that's why I give the example of that later. Drugs that enhance the actions of neurotransmitters are known as agonists. Drugs that inhibit the actions of neurotransmitters are known as antagonists. You know I have a different color shirt on. I was trying to mix up the shirt so hopefully you can see the screen, but I don't know if it's really having an effect. Anyway, these are the different drugs that I probably won't go over, but what I'll do is fast forward to the specific areas of the brain. Um, the medulla controls survival functions such as uh, breathing, heart rate, swallowing, vomiting, gagging, urination, orgasm. Um, you'll find a funny YouTube clip here about the medulla. It's very different, but it's some water boy, some fresh H2O medulla oblongata. And the pons regulate sleep and arousal and coordinates movements of the left and right sides of the body. Cerebellum, the little mini brain, essential for coordinated movement and balance. Motor learning and motor memory may be involved in planning, remembering events, using language, experiencing emotion. Interesting. Then we've got the midbrain. Several structures in midbrain involved in reflexive movement of the eyes and body. Substantia nigra is involved in initiation of voluntary motor activity. Critical for the production of dopamine, Parkinson's disease is caused by the death of substantia nigra cells and the resulting loss of dopamine pr produced by those cells. Kind of gives you that overview now of the four brain subcortical structures. And here we go, jumping into those. Thalamus, known as the gateway to the cortex, receives, organizes, and relays all sensory information except for smell. 
hypothalamus receives impo- input um, from and influences really every part of the body. It's really small, but it influences a huge amount of uh, the body. It regulates body temperature, sleeping and waking, blood pressure, blood glucose level, motivations for many behaviors, eating, drinking, aggression, and sex. So big, a little thing, a uh, big deal, and it influences that. Um, and certainly also influences the uh, sympathetic nervous system, parasympathetic nervous system. It influences a lot of those um, functions and behaviors um, through uh, hormones. It's right next to some glands that then send out, like the pineal gland and different glands that then send out to other uh, glands, and you'll read about that later with the endocrine system. Hippocampus, formation of new memories, memories of places and objects in space. Remember, taxi drivers have an increased volume of gray matter there. And um, I think they give the example of the London taxi drivers who have to know a lot. Maybe not taxi drivers where I live. Um, The amygdala serves a vital role in our learning to associate things with emotional responses. For example, fear um, and in processing emotional information, happy faces and sexual arousal. People that have damage to the amygdala have big problems because they can't recognize any problematic, fear, what normal or fearful situations that would protect them. It makes sure the camera's still rolling. We are still rolling. You can probably see that slide now that my mug is going there. And then the basal ganglia, motor planning and movement reward circuit, experiencing reward and motivating behavior. The NA, the nucleus accumbens, dopamine dopamine boost motivates you to want to do things that are desirable for example eat food or spend time with a certain person so um, if you're all stoked on some food or um, able to spend some time with some cool person and basically you're feeling good then you're feeling a dopamine boost via the nucleus accumbens that area these subcortical structures with the cingulate gyrus make up what's called the limbic system and then remember the cerebral cortex, and I kind of went over that, and its important functions, especially related to humans. Outer layer of the forebrain, uh, site of all thoughts, detailed perceptions, and complex behaviors. Divided into two halves, the left and right hemisphere. The left is often thought of as logical and language, uh, Broca's area, and that has been kind of borne out in terms of, you'll see in chapter three with uh, Michael Gazzaniga and uh, Joseph Ledoux and Antonio Damasio and various people doing research um, on the brain. And in the right brain, spatial relationships, locating objects around you, understanding a map, recognizing faces, understanding emotional aspects of language, and abstract thinking. Hemispheres control muscles on opposite sides of the body. You see visual info on the opposite side, and you feel sense info on the opposite side as well. The hemispheres are connected by the corpus callosum, and each cerebral um, hemisphere has four areas, which are called the lobes, occipital lobe, the parietal lobe, the temporal lobe, and the frontal lobe. And there's a chopped view of half, half a brain chopped in half. Brain chopped in half. I thought this is cool with the homunculus, and then it kind of shows the motor cortex and the different areas on the brain related to um, your movement for those areas as well as the uh, somatosensory cortex and how certain areas are bigger um, and that's related to uh, you know increased sensation temporal lobes processing auditory information and for recognizing detailed objects like faces uh, fusiform face area hippocampus and amygdala reside in the temporal lobe and frontal lobes, important for movement and complex processes such as ras- rational thought, attention, and social processes. Prefrontal cortex makes up 30% of the brain, difference uh, humans versus animals in complexity and organization of neural circuits. Um, critical for rational thought, provides for a sense of self and capacity for empathy and guilt and following social norms, feeling emotionally connected to others. So you can see that um, in terms of us, we have this prefrontal cortex, which is incredibly important, and it's much more complex in terms of its organizational neural circuitry. And um, we have a much bigger area of prefrontal cortex as well, 
and it's critical for all these things that really make us human. Um, following social norms, sense of self, capacity for empathy and guilt, which you don't see in uh, animals, um, chimpanzees and lower as much. Ah, you might say capacity for empathy and guilt. Maybe you might see more in them. Who knows? I don't think. Uh, and then, oh, this is with Phineas Gage. So you got this bar shot up through his uh, head. He survived, but he had some issues. Uh, he had issues with maintaining attention, keeping ideas in mind when distractions are occurring, developing and acting on plans, and he had issues with interacting with people. So I think I'll leave you at that for the end of chapter two. Best of success on the rest of that, and I'll see you for chapter three. Sweet!